So it's my pleasure today to um, introduce Dr. Nikki Selmond as today's second speaker for her talk on extracellular vesicle associated glycans for the diagnosis and prognostication of breast cancer. Uh, Dr. Solomon uh, completed her Bachelor of Science with Honours from the University of Leeds in the UK in 2011. Dr. Solomon then went on to pursue PhD studies at the Beeston Institute for Cancer Research under the guidance of Professor Jim Norman. It was here that she discovered the role of extracellular vesicles derived from mutant P53 expressing cancer cells in the promotion of a tumorigenic phenotype. She then commenced a postdoctoral scientist position at the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca in the UK, where she investigated the use of extracellular vesicles as therapeutic delivery vehicles. It was then in the fall of 2018 that Dr. Salman relocated to Vancouver, where she started her second postdoctoral position in my laboratory at the University of British Columbia. It is here that she is exploring the role of extracellular vesicle glycans in breast cancer progression and metastasis. In particular, she's working towards characterizing the glycan content of extracellular vesicles found in the blood of individuals with breast cancer in the hopes that we can identify biomarkers for the use in the diagnosis and prognostication of breast cancer. Uh, so with that, uh, I, would, I will pass it off to Nikki for her to commence her talk. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to present at this uh, webinar. Um, so yes, as Carla said, I'm a postdoc in her lab at the University of British Columbia and very much um, one of the research projects I'm working on at the moment is looking at extracellular vesicle associated glycans for the diagnosis and prognostication of breast cancer. Um, and I, during this talk then I'm just going to briefly tell you about the project and where we're up to so far. I will discuss um, and introduce extracellular vesicles for those that are unfamiliar and why what makes them good markers for a breast cancer. I'll just put my pointer on. There it is. Um, and then I'll introduce breast cancer diagnosis and prognostication and why it needs to be proved. Very briefly, we'll touch upon that. I uh, will then talk about extracellular vesicle isolation from plasma and the optimization steps we had to go through. It um, is slightly more problematic than isolating vesicles from cell culture supernatant, that's for sure. I'll then show you our proof of concept um, that we can analyze the glycan profile of our slow vesicles using electron array. And this is with a fantastic collaboration with the Laura Mahal Laboratory at the University of Alberta. I'll then show you our large scale study design and what we, where we're up to so far with that um, so that we can analyze and uh, get statistical, signif statistically significant results from it um, and hopefully find a novel glycan signature that we can use to diagnose and prognosticate breast cancer. So to start with then, um, extracellular vesicles. Um, so basically they are lipid bilayer enclosed particles that are released by every cell type. Um, they are released into the extracellular environment of um, the, the cell. So it could be in vitro, they could be released into the cell culture supernatant. In vivo, they're re released into the immediate environment and can actually then end up in biological fluids such as the blood. There's various different members of the extracellular vesicle family. Uh, Microvesicles are released directly from the plasma membrane and they can range between 50 nanometers to a micron. Um, larger membrane-derived vesicles can be released in processes such as apoptosis and oncogenesis. Uh, exosomes are uh, probably one of the well-known members of the family. They're formed with, uh, within the endosomal system. And when the multifascicular body fuses with the plasma membrane, the intraluminal vesicles are released into the extracellular environment as exosomes. And these are slightly smaller on average than microvesicles, and they're between 50 and 150 nanometers. There's a slightly new member of the family that may or may not remain in the family. Exomeres are um, particles released by cells as well. They're generally very small, under 35 nanometers. Whether they're vesicular or not is yet to be determined, but they definitely seem to be important. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, the, thing we are look, the things we are looking at are exosomes and microvesicles. They're very hard to separate from one another, so that's why we term, term, talk about them together as extracellular vesicles. So what do they contain? 
Well, they contain everything that uh, may be present in the cell of origin, except for any cellular organelles. So they contain nucleic acids, amino acids, metabolites, intracellular proteins, lipids, and transmembrane proteins, and obviously glycans that are on these uh, that are on these proteins. And um, these are very interestingly transferred in a functional capacity to recipient cells. So these actually these schools are very important windows of information and it's becoming very uh, understood in the field that they can kind of tell us what's going on in the cell from which they're derived. For example, in pathology, if our cells are expressing different proteins, like in cancer, we often get cells expressing lots of different proteins to promote physiological processes, um, such as tumorigenic processes, I should say, we would expect those proteins to be um, expressed on the extracellular vesicles derived from those cells as well. So why are they so important? Well, they deliver their contents to other recipient cells in a functional capacity. And in breast cancer um, and all different cancer types, many natural physiological mechanisms and also many other pathophysiological mechanisms, this has been found to be very important. I'll focus on breast cancer though. It has been found that exercise these calls released by the tumor can be taken up by many different cell types in the tumor microenvironment and affect the way those cells act and promote tumor genesis. Some examples are uh, they could be taken up by endothelial cells and promote angiogenesis. They can be taken up by immune cells and promote immune suppression. They can be taken up by fellow tumor cells um, to promote their mobilization and metastasis to distant organs. And they can even be taken up at distant sites um, in the body. So they can be transported by the blood to different sites in the body where they're taken up by the recipient cells and promote metastasis to that particular organ. So they're very important. And the fact they have such distinct functional properties as compared to extracellular vesicles released by normal cell counterparts of the tumor, we would expect that there will be a difference in their content composition. And a lot of, a lot of work has been done in looking at extracellular vesicles as biomarkers for many diseases, including cancer, um, in terms of, especially in the realms of the nucleic acid contents. Um, looking at proteins and especially looking at the, the glycan profiles of our extracellular vesicles has been much less, um, less investigated. Um, so this is our aim um, in, our, in our study is to isolate our extracellular vesicles from breast cancer patient plasma and identify whether we can find any unique protein and glycan signatures in those plasma samples that may, we may be able to use to diagnose and prognosticate the, the patient's cancer. Um, this is a, uh, just a simple schematic to show you how, how our tumor, ex tumor extracellular vesicles can be released into the extracellular environment. Obviously, these tumors are um, innovated by blood vessels, um, and angiogenic uh, processes take place, um, and these extracellular vesicles can end up inside those blood vessels and therefore in the main circulation. So by a very simple blood test, we can find thousands and thousands of extracellular vesicles in a single drop of blood. Of course, there's a mixture. So we can find lots of extracellular vesicles from our normal cells, um, but we would hope to be also be able to identify extracellular vesicles that may be secreted by our cancer cell through a specific protein uh, that's expressed on the cancer cell surface or even in, inside the cell. And the idea is that the Identification of these cancer-derived extracellular vesicles would be useful for diagnosis, but what would be even more exciting as well is to also find these extracellular vesicles that are from cells that are beginning to be more aggressive and metastatic, and that they might express another uh, protein that's enabling them to uh, migrate and break away from the tumor and survive, and therefore this will begin to, begin to allow us to prognosticate an individual patient's cancer. And um, why is that important? Well, uh, currently we diagnose breast cancer using a few techniques, mainly imaging using mammogram and ultra, um, ultrasound, and then a needle biopsy um, is normally carried out after that. 
The problem is with mam mammograms is that they have a quite a high false positive rate. To be able to use a test in conjunction with that would hopefully give us some, um, some more confidence in, in the fact that we are diagnosing a breast tumor. Um, also, neither technique, um, screening technique is able to distinguish whether a tumor is likely to metastasize or not. So we are unable to currently uh, prognosticate a tumor accurately in the early stages of diagnosis. And that would be something very useful to do um, because then we know that we need to approach, if we know a patient's tumor is very likely to be metastatic, we know their treatment regime should be approached quite aggressively and rapidly. So it will prevent uh, under treatment of patients that do not have metastatic cancer and are unlikely to get metastatic cancer and it will promote aggressive treatment of patients that need that, uh, that, that uh, aggression, aggressive treatment, uh, hopefully to extend their life and, uh, and allow them to be treated more efficiently. So the first problem was uh, to investigate is how to isolate extracellular vesicles from plasma. I've worked on extracellular vesicles for many years and I, this is the first time I was handling plasma and it is quite problematic for various reasons. Plasma obviously contains many, many proteins, albumin being one, which uh, seems to co-isolate with extracellular vesicles quite frequently. Additionally, plasma, unlike cell culture uh, media, contains many lipoproteins. And unfortunately, some of those lipoproteins are the same size as extracellular vesicles. So very difficult to separate from, from your extracellular vesicle preparation. So to start off with, I, I kind of tested a few different uh, techniques uh, to isolate the extracellular vesicles. The first one was size exclusion chromatography. So for all of these, I used 500 microliters of plasma, and this gives us sufficient extracellular vesicles uh, isolated to work with. Uh, for size exclusion chromatography, then we add our plasma to a column which contains a resin that has very fine um, invaginations uh, within the resin. These invaginations cause proteins, smaller molecules and proteins to become trapped um, and make their way through the column at a much slower rate than the larger molecules which don't get trapped by the resin and they can elute much faster. And the principle of this is our extracellular vesicles are eluted and enriched in our fraction, which is depleted of protein, um, hopefully. The second technique we use, and this is a very common technique used for isolated extracellular vesicles from plasma is precipitation. Uh, this is using something like PEG or a commercially available reagent called ExoQuick. And what we do is we add that reagent to the plasma, incubate it. It works to tie up all the water molecules. So any insoluble proteins or extracellular vesicles in the plasma will pellet at a relatively low centrifugation speed. This, however, in principle doesn't work so well because all of the proteins also pellet with the extracellular vesicles. We then tried another kit which aims to clean up this precipitate. So it's a kit from SBI uh, where we precipitate the extracellular vesicles using ExoQuick. And then the extracellular vesicles are cleaned up. The precipitate is cleaned up using their column, which is, uh, works with an unspecified mechanism of action to remove um, extra proteins in that precipitate. Okay, so here we have the data that we started with when we were isolating all these calls using these techniques. We've got size exclusion, we precipitated with PEG followed by size exclusion. This is our exoquick precipitation followed by our ultra column to just exoquick and PEG precipitation on its own. And I use this ultra kit followed by size exclusion here. Unfortunately, this uh, technique using both the ultra and size exclusion kit results in a very, very, very low protein yield. And this is not very useful um, for processes going forward. Uh, so and I had to load the entire preparation on the gel um, here to, to see something. So size exclusion chromatography then gives us a very nice marker, EV marker CD63 here. Uh, interestingly, the ExoQuick Ultra gives us a CD81, also an exercise vesicle marker. Um, using precipitation on its own, we don't generally see many EV markers, but we do see a lot of albumin. So we know this isn't going to be appropriate for our, our, us going forward. And like I said earlier, the ultra followed by size exclusion, although it gives us a lovely preparation uh, that includes CD63 and CD81, the protein concentration is too long to feasibly use it in downstream processes. 
So we narrowed down our selection to size exclusion chromatography and the ultra kit. Our electron microscopy shows us that our extracellular calls are present um, and there are many vesicular structures, some of them though may be lipoproteins, which you can see down here. APOA1, uh, we can't remove it. Um, it's very difficult to remove from our, our, our EV preparations. Um, but we know that we are isolating bona fide vesicle, extracellular vesicles as well. So to help us make our mind up about which, pro, which, uh, which technique to use going forward, we did some proteomic analysis of our extracellular vesicle preparations. Um, here, I just um, did some simple analysis of the proteins that we identified and what, how they group in terms of biological process, cellular component and molecular function. And you can see both preparations are very similar. Uh, we can't see anything distinctly different. And very happily, we do see that a lot of the proteins we see are associated with physical um, membrane uh, cellular compartments. And this is what we would expect for an extracellular physical preparation. And when we look at the pathways that are enriched um, in our particular protein selection, we see that physical mediated transport is the top one in both preparations. So this is really um, promising. We were happy we were isolated. Our extracellular physical preparations were pretty good. Um, and to really to decide which one to use, uh, I then had a closer look at the actual proteins in the list. And um, I took from, well, there's a database called Vesicopedia, which you can get a list of the top 100 EV proteins. Here I took the top 50 um, and listed them and then had a look at how many proteins we could see in our, our mass spec um, analysis of each preparation. As you can see here, size exclusion chromatography wins. It's got uh, 27 of the 50 extracellular vesicle markers or proteins that are commonly identified in mass spectrometry studies. This data is taken from at least 200 to 400 uh, studies uh, as compared to the ultra preparation, which we could only find 15. Most importantly, some of the very common extracellular vesicle markers were not present in the ultra sample as well. So, we have one of the HSP proteins is not present in our ultra sample. CD9 isn't. Uh, Alex is not present. Integrin beta 1, CDC42, and flotillin. And these are very important extracellular vesicle markers that we do expect to see in our extracellular vesicle preparations. So this made our mind up. We're going to go forward with our experiments and use size exclusion chromatography. Okay, so to then analyze the glycans, we have a collaboration with the Mahal Laboratory at the University of Alberta. Um, and they are, uh, are complete experts in analyzing glycan profiles in biological samples using uh, lectin arrays. As a quick overview of, of what they do, they take a biological sample for us, we, we're taking our serum, we extract our glycoproteins and label them with fluorescent markers. They've created a system where they have, they've created a lectin microarray where we can um, use lots and lots of different lectins to that our, our biological material can then bind to if the glycans are present. And then they can scan and analyze the data uh, depending on what fluorescent signal they detect in each well. We did a very preliminary analysis with them as a proof of concept of two healthy plasma samples and two breast cancer samples. Evidently, this is very early data, so we can't say much about what patterns we're seeing or what, 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 what glycans may be present or not, uh, but it was a good proof of concept uh, analysis and gave us confidence to move forward with the large scale production of our samples. But what was really good to see in this uh, array is that we had some uh, lectins that we saw a very positive result for very consistently across all samples, across all healthy and breast cancer samples. Some we had a very consistent low level of expression. Um, however, it was also need, really nice to see that we also did have um, inter individual variation. So every now and then there was an individual that had a very high amount of a particular glycan or a very, and, and the same was in healthy and or in breast cancer. So it was nice to see that our, our biological samples were binding specifically to the lectins depending on what glycans they were expressing on their surface. 
So we move forward to our large scale study where we used 50 healthy, 148 breast cancer and 229 plasma samples. It's worth noting here, our breast cancer plasma samples all have up to 10 year follow up history. So we can really look at the subtypes of cancer and also if that person has relapsed and metastasized, we can really start to pull out uh, all of the information that will be useful to identify glycans that are going to be good at diagnosing breast cancer, but also at prognosticating how somebody might do uh, with their disease. So of those 220 samples, then we had to individually isolate them by size exclusion chromatography. They then needed to be concentrated, a protein quantitated, labeled, dialyzed, and then they had to have a final microBCR saved for protein quantitation. Um, this was a fairly long and tedious process uh, where we had to do so much size exclusion chromatography and watching our columns uh, drip all day. Um, lots and lots of tubes were used. I can't imagine how much plastic we used during this experiment. It was so much and so many BCA assays. Um, I don't want to do with them anymore. <laughs> But now we've shipped all of our samples to Laura Mahal and her laboratory, and now we wait and see. So we've purified our, we've optimized our purification and fully characterized our extra vesicles that we purify. Uh, we've got our proteomic analysis of our EVs complete, and this gives us proof of concept. We can also do proteomic analysis on our vesicles. Uh, we've got proof of concept that we have our glycan detection um, complete and working on our, our vesicles. And, Having a proteomic analysis in hand in hand with a glycan analysis will be a really nice data set, we think. We've isolated our clinical cohort of 20, 220 EV samples um, and we've sent them to our collaborators. And now we just wait and see um, and, and hopefully we will discover a, a novel glycan biomarker for breast cancer diagnosis and breast cancer prognostication. So with that, I uh, thank you for listening. And um, obviously I'd like to obviously acknowledge and thank my uh, supervisor, Dr. Carla Williams and everybody in the laboratory. But a quick shout out to in particular to Karen and Kelly who helped me uh, very much with the isolation of all of those 220 samples. Um, obviously Professor Laura Mahal and her lab members have been excellent in helping with all the, giving me all the information I need to do to get the, these samples isolated and labeled. Um, and yeah, we're really looking forward to seeing what these results look like in the future. Um, and the mass spec facility we, we worked with in the Michael Smith laboratories at Jason and Renata have been working with us to really get that optimized as well. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for listening and happy to take any questions.